it's going to be um, captured on my YouTube channel so that other students who have the same kind of questions you do will be able to listen in as well. Um, so I really love the new technology today. Did any of you grow up without a computer in your house? Didn't think so. <laughs> okay, cool. I grew up um, and it was a question of whether or not we were going to keep the TV. Um, so that was kind of fun. As a matter of fact, I, I feel like I'm on the cusp of the baby boomer and uh, the, that generation because sometimes they say baby boomers go to 1964 and other times they back it up. Captured on my YouTube channel. And I'm going to do this other fun thing and say turn off my, um, my, I was testing earlier so to make sure that the image was good and the sound was good. You have to actually turn the test off though. So I was, um, when I was in school learning how to type on a real typewriter, it was a manual royal typewriter. Do you remember what a manual typewriter, have any of you seen a manual typewriter? Once. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I'm getting scared now. Now I'm really feeling old. Saturday was my birthday and um, I'm having more fun celebrating the older I get. I think getting old is, is fun, being old, no, not so much. But um, that, that manual typewriter um, in the fall when I took typing in the spring was replaced by electric typewriters. So um, I, I'm been right on the cusp of all this kind of technology breakthroughs pretty much my whole life. And I'm saying that because um, a lot of people are going to look to you as you enter the workforce as people who grew up with computers and know the internet and get social networking and if you don't look and act like they expect you to look and act you're going to be um, you're going to lose credibility really quickly. I've seen it happen time and time again. So it's really important that you transition your social networking from personal and college to career um, as quickly as possible. I am thrilled to hear that half of you don't have a LinkedIn profile yet, and the reason is that you haven't made a bad impression on anybody yet. How's that? So you're you're sort of you're sort of ahead of the game. So um, I sent Sean some um, documents, a LinkedIn info uh, profile info guide that you're welcome. Excellent. Um, also, we have an ebook, Networking for Nerds, for the socially inept college student. We didn't pick the title, but um, we we were asked to write the book by College and Career. So we wrote that a couple of years ago. So there may be some dated stuff in there, but it's still relevant for the content. Um, there is nothing that replaces face-to-face -face contact. Um, if I could be there tonight, I'd be there in person. I'd make the drive if it was three hours to be there in person and be with you tonight. But um, I'm glad to be able to connect like this. Um, when you guys entered the room, I heard some of you saying hello, and um, you had met each other for the first time this evening. Did, did anybody meet somebody new for the first time tonight? Okay, several of you. And and we don't have business cards, right? So how do you keep up with each other after that? Say you like this person or they're taking a, a similar class or you want to follow up with them later? Facebook. Facebook. Brilliant. I, I joined Facebook when I was in college. My sister and I were ta both taking MBA classes, so that was fun. Um, so that's good. So you connect, right? And that allows you to maintain a relationship with people. Well, the relationship online is just going to allow you to do more faster when you can I mean I've got people say you can only keep up with like 125 people at a time in, in a close in a semi loose relationship I've got 30,000 LinkedIn connections 5,000 Facebook friends 100,000 Twitter followers and I don't know how many people have circled me on G plus anymore but it, it's the people that I maintain close relationships with um, semi-close, at least, you know, handshake relationships with, are, are in the hundreds, if not close to a thousand. And I can do that now because um, when I meet somebody at a conference and we sit down and have dinner together and we connect on Facebook and I post on Facebook and so do they, I can keep up with what's going on in their lives without having to pick up the phone. Um, actually, sometimes I get annoyed that I have to pick up the phone and call somebody to catch up with them because they're not on social media. Um, and, and if it annoys somebody like me who is 51, it's got to annoy somebody who's, you know, on top of it all the time um, and, and has grown up with that. So the most important thing is your presence. I'm going to flip to a, um, to a PowerPoint and Sean, let me know if this comes across uh, correctly or if it's cut off on the edges? Absolutely. 
Uh, this looks good. Looks good. Excellent. So um, basically, we. If you think about it, and a lot of people haven't, LinkedIn started in 2003. That was 11 years ago. So did Integrated Alliances. And we started out as a networking company. We didn't start out training LinkedIn. We didn't know LinkedIn existed yet. But we started out as a networking company. And if anybody wants to tweet about what you're hearing tonight, leave your cell phones on or whatever. And my Twitter handle is at Lori Ruff, just my name. Um, but we, you know, we started out as a networking company, and then we started. You know, people were asking about LinkedIn, and and you know, could we help? And then my partner, Mike O'Neill, had this brilliant idea to have a public class to do something different for a bunch of association executives and the media in town. And now Denver, Colorado, where he started the company, is one of three places where there are more LinkedIn users per capita than Facebook users, which is kind of interesting to me because um, it, it spread. So think about um, who he caught in that very first class that was sponsored by LinkedIn, by the way, um, were association executives. They were executives at member organizations. They had a lot of people that they were invested in providing value to and keeping them engaged to retain the membership. Does that make sense to everybody? And I'm telling you this because if, as you enter the workforce and, and from today forward, if you can find ways to provide value to people, people will continue to come to you for more value. And that is how you build your own personal network, your own personal community, and your own personal um, fan base, if you will. So we um, want an integrated presence you know if you have your name or whatever your handle is on the all the different sub uh, platforms on LinkedIn you can find me at linkedin.com forward slash in forward slash Lori Ruff on twitter.com at Lori Ruff Google plus or plus .google .com plus Lori Ruff facebook.com forward slash Lori Ruff and YouTube sadly is Lori Ruff 2000 uh, because of a um, uh, a switch that they made um, in, in allowing you to not cha change your usernames. So the more consistent you can be, the easier it will be for people to find you. And it's not just your URLs, um, it's also your photographs, your image. Um, on Facebook you'll see me in a more relaxed state than you will on LinkedIn, although on LinkedIn you may find me in a relaxed state talking business because I want to be who I am everywhere I go. Um, I was one of those people who was shy as a kid and it bothered me if people didn't like me. Um, and I figured out one day that there are almost now 300 million people on LinkedIn. There's got to be a few people out there who are going to like me just like I am. So don't be afraid to be yourself and to put your personality out there and to show your character and the things that you're passionate about because there will be people out there that that resonates with and the more specific you get the closer you're going to come to um, finding those people and having them find you. Now if you think about IBM everybody knows who IBM is right? Yeah. The big international business machine um, or independent business marketers in this case. You know, so it's important to think about who you are, what you want to be. As you're approaching, you know, life, um, a, a new form of, of, of life where you're hopefully getting paid instead of paying, um, you have to think about what do you love and what kind of a what kind of a brand am I going to build? And that's likely going to change over the course of your life, but it should still people should still, after watching you for a while, feel that it's been consistent and that they can follow the growth. So our LinkedIn business methodology that we've developed says that you've got to do things in a certain order in order to receive the best success. So for those of you who don't have a profile yet, it's okay. You start out with building your profile on any network, not just on LinkedIn. But I saw the video of you guys in the room. Um, I know that you nobody wore their bathrobe and fuzzy slippers to the meeting tonight. And you know, you dress appropriately to where you're gonna go. So think about LinkedIn as a networking platform, not a place where you go get a job, not a place where you go make a sale, not a place where you go find uh, business intelligence, but it's a networking platform first and foremost. So building your profile, dressing it up appropriately for that environment is the first thing you need to do and it's the most important. It's going to take a lot of time up front, 
but then it'll be a lot easier to maintain over a period of time. Once you build your profile, then you can start building your network because as soon as you start reaching out to people, inviting them to connect with you, saying hello or engaging with them, the first thing they're going to do is go look at your profile. And if your profile looks like, you know, garbage, garbage in, garbage out, okay? Um, so you want to make sure that that presence that you have is, is polished and professional in the way that you want to be recognized. And I'm really going to recommend that sometime between now and the end of school that you look at each other's profiles and give each other ideas. Um, and you also look at people who you'd like to emulate. So look at, um, at, at people who are in careers that you hope to be in. Look at their profiles, especially if they're good profiles, what they say about themselves, and emulate those things. Once you have built your network, you can engage people. Um, and you've got people to talk to now. And that's how you get hired, you get sales done, you get recruits whatever it is that you're trying to accomplish. Now, on your profile, this is the most important part of your profile. This is a, a friend of mine um, and the son of a friend of mine, Bob Bowden. He's in Thailand right now um, teaching English as a second language to, um, to students in Thailand. And um, he's taken a year to do that so that he can continue to um, expand his knowledge of different cultures in the world and you notice that his headline he's got a picture and sadly he doesn't have the best picture that's his dad standing next to him with his hand on his shoulder but um, you know it's still you can see him you can look him in the eye you can feel that he's trustworthy if you try to hide or you've got that little ghosty thing that you know doesn't really say it just says this person hasn't put up a picture they don't know how to put up a picture they're scared to put up a picture none of those are positive statements so putting up a picture, even from your phone, is going to be better than having no picture at all. And his headline, you've got 120 characters there, USC cultural anthropology graduate seeking a role in sales, marketing, or project management, currently ESL teacher in Prey, Thailand. So that tells you very quickly when he shows up in his search who he is, what he's looking for, and what he's doing right now. Um, and it, it's something that's a little bit interesting as well. Oops, I went backwards instead of forwards. So once you get to your headline and you've got your name, which should have nothing in your name field but your name, your natural name, and lettered credentials, MBA, PhD, certification letters, and things like that, it's really important that you don't put anything else in your name field because LinkedIn will shut down your account. Not just close it, not just hide it, but they'll completely wipe you from the system. From what I understand, it's really, you've got to start from scratch to get back again. So your summary is the next thing. You walked in tonight, you shook hands with people, and people you hadn't met, you said hello, you may have um, introduced yourself and told people who you are. Hi, this is Lori Ruff. I'm the LinkedIn Diva. Uh, my fans call me the LinkedIn Diva because I love social networking and educating people about the practical use of this cool technology. This is what I'm passionate about. I'm here to help you. And so it's a very first person, conversational, topical um, thing that allows people, when they read your summary, to find out who you are and what you're all about as if you are the person standing there introducing yourself to them. You'll also tell them where you can help them and how you can help them and how and why to contact you. So you always end with a call to action. Um, who you are, what you're about, what you do, and how and why they can contact you. So practical application about that in a moment. But you've got 2,000 characters in your summary to really rock out that part of your profile on LinkedIn, which is really what people are going to listen to for the most part. That is your first um, first impression that you're making on people. Now, tap into your experience. Uh, some of you are going to say you haven't had a job yet. Some of you have had a job, but it's not great, um, or it's not like the kind of experience somebody would want, corporate experience. If you've volunteered, anything that you've done, if you've done special projects, if you've written things, if you're um, on the yearbook staff or a member of the, of the um, um, any kinds of clubs and stuff, 
put that kind of stuff into your profile. By the way, Sean, you did a pretty good job on some of the stuff that I saw in your profile. Uh -huh. you, wanna, you wanna revisit uh, a, lot of, a lot of areas. Former employers, when you're building your network, you want to go back to former employers or people who hired you for volunteer activities and connect with those people on LinkedIn. Because you're not just connecting with those people on LinkedIn, you're connecting with those people and their networks. So when you start using LinkedIn, you're not just going to connect with Lori Ruff, the LinkedIn Diva, you're going to connect to 30,000 people that I have on my first level um, as direct connections and millions of people that are on my second that you'll be able to send a message to through me, either an introduction, an invitation, something like that. And that's going to be really powerful. Remember your volunteer experience and in LinkedIn now, when you do your profile, if you haven't done it already, go into edit mode and on the top right it offers you additional sections that you can put in. Volunteer experiences, organizations that you work with, projects that you've done, publications, which don't necessarily have to be a book. It could be a column in a newspaper or a magazine. It could be um, a white paper or a term paper that you did. Major projects and publications again and then don't forget about your adult network and I call it that because um, I don't know about you guys, but when I went out networking, when I first started working, I didn't think about who my parents might know or who might live in my neighborhood. Um, we did this presentation in um, for a group of students in, in Lynchburg, Virginia, and one of the girls um, went home that night, talked to her dad, and said, hey, dad, who are some of our neighbors? And he looked at her kind of funny, and she said, well, I mean, you know, where do they work? Who are they out in the, in the real world? And his dad started naming names and taking off companies and she's, she's realizing that some of the companies that she's interested in working for had, had high level executives right there in her neighborhood. So she started going around knocking on doors asking for informational interviews and to connect with these people on LinkedIn. They accepted both and she very quickly found a role where she was really, really happy. So here's a bad profile. No picture, no nothing, no summary. It's very, there's nothing there. Give me something to work with. You know, if I'm, if I'm trying to find out who you are, there's really nothing here. An okay um, profile has, you know, your name. It has a, a title. This one says, you know, my, my title at my company. But, you know, it works. And there's a picture. It's a little bit dark, but it's, it's still better than no picture at all. And a short summary. Um, and a good one, this is the, the summary, it's kind of broken out. That paragraph in the middle there needs to be a little bit shorter because remember, people are not only looking at your profile on a computer screen, but also on a mobile device. So you want to use shorter paragraphs now than you have in the past. Um, but on his headline and stuff, he's got his headline rocking out, he's got a picture that's a little bit brighter, the orange is a, a color that attracts the eye. So those are just some examples. Um, one of the most important places for you guys to, um, to fill out as you get ready to transition your networking is on the bottom of your profile, advice for people who want to contact you. And so if you have advice for contacting Robert, here's what, going back to Robert Bowden, um, here's what he has in his profile. I'm interested in networking with people who have a global mindset and interest in cultural and social behaviors and those who have worked or traveled in other countries. If you're looking for someone like me, I invite a message via LinkedIn to discuss how I can add value to your team. To facilitate a conversation while I'm in Thailand, we can schedule a call via Skype. So, sounds intelligent, sounds professional. I'm interested in networking with these kinds of people. And again, the more specific you can get, the more people will feel like you're talking to them. Um, I, I was involved in a business networking international group and it's a group of people who own businesses. Um, they get together with other people who are in non-competing businesses and they exchange leads every week. And you're supposed to deliver three week, three leads during the week for a number of anywhere from 10 to 15 people in the group. And um, a chiropractor came one time and he said, he stood up and he said, a great referral for me this week is anyone with a spine. And I'm looking around the room and I can't think of anyone with a spine. And, and that was pretty sad. I mean, I'm sure we all have spines, but I can't think of anybody to refer him to, even though I'm sitting there with 15 other people, all of whom have spines. 
But the point is that it's so general that people can't bring their minds in and, and focus on anything specific for you. And so I asked him, I said, you know, I, you're not helping. I said, tell us about a success story you had. And so he, um, he had recently helped a man, or he was helping a gentleman who had bursitis in his shoulder. He said, well, this guy's been coming to me for about three and a half weeks now, and he reported the other day that the pain in his shoulder is lessening noticeably. And I thought, well, that's brilliant, because my dad's got bursitis. So I was able to refer my father to him. And the same thing is going to happen as you go forward. Um, it's going to be really hard to decide, well, what do I want to do? Where do I want to work? Think about, rather, the culture of the work environment you'd like to work in or the things that you'd like to do, the people you'd like to work with, and be specific around as many of those things as you can. Other people will then reach out to you. We, for example, our outbound messages are all about training salespeople and training sales teams on LinkedIn, yet we get inbound calls for recruiters and other kinds of teams as well, marketing teams, um, associations and, and stuff like that. So outbound, focused on LinkedIn for sales, inbound, people read our stuff, they want to know more from us. I might even be talking to a group of college students one night. So do you guys know what a social graph is? No. no. How about a social circle? Yes. You know, just kind of, you know, look around the room, right? You're, you're in a social circle right now. And what happens with, with that, that's in, that's in real life. So in real life you have a social circle and those circles can be um, professional, family oriented, community oriented, where you work and play, where you spend um, free time, where you might meet your spouse, you know, that kind of stuff. And when I talk about tightening your social graph and you're likely to hear this more um, in the next few years, I'm talking about how do I build my profile and my network so that I get closer and bring more of the people that I want to spend my time with to me. So this is kind of an image of a social graph that has been created and the blues are all work related, the oranges are all other uh, personal life um, related, and the green is relatives. Isn't it amazing how much the relatives come into the work in this particular person's social graph when I would have thought it would be the other way around? So the ways that you build your social graph on LinkedIn in this networking environment is when you put out your profile built and you start connecting to people and you accept connections, that will tighten your social graph. You're going to connect and invite people and accept invitations from people you know but you'll also accept invitations from people who are peers that maybe you haven't met them yet. If you go to a conference and you would um, talk to that person at a conference or you might work with that person side by side or you might hire that person or be hired by that person, you probably will want to go ahead and accept their invitation on LinkedIn anyway because it's about networking. And I don't know about you guys, but when I go to a networking event, I'm not just going there to meet people I know. I'm going there to meet new people and to find out what the new what the people I already know are doing, what they're up to. Another way to tighten your social graph is with recommendations on your profile. And these are the written recommendations. So you can receive recommendations not just for your work experience, but also for your school experience. So for the group of you that worked on putting this event together tonight, you can recommend each other carefully. You can recommend each other for the work that you saw them do in the project this evening. Um, and I say carefully because you don't want recommendations to sound like mutual pats on the back. You'll lose points, um, if you will, for, for that kind of stuff. But be specific. You know, we were tasked with doing these things and this was the, uh, what, we, what we accomplished and here was the outcome from that. The more specific and numbers generated and quantitative you can be, the better. But if, for example, I recommend Sean and talk about the, the experience that I had with him, guess whose profile will be forever connected to Sean's, right? So it's going gonna, it's gonna to close my social graph with his so that people who are in my network, when you go onto LinkedIn and they say, you may also know these people, it may recommend other people that I know um, to Sean because it recognizes that we've done work together. And then the third place on your profile, of course, is your skills and expertise. Now, 
I don't know about you, the uh, when I land on somebody's profile and that big obnoxious blue box pops up, I just want it to be gone. And um, and I do recommend people or I I I endorse their skills and things, but it's sometimes there's been this whole hubbub of whether or not it's valuable or not. I'll tell you what it is though is social proof that you know what you're talking about. Um, I have seen people who had very few um, recommendations or endorsements on their skills and people said well they must not know what they're talking about because nobody's endorsing them. And this from the same person who's complaining about all the endorsements taking place. So even though people aren't really completely into it um, as far as um, the actual doing of the endorsements, they do look at them as part of social proof. So do you, does anybody in the room have an idea of who you would like to um, go to work for? What kind of company or a particular company? Um, so this summer I'm working at uh, Goldman Sachs actually. Okay, excellent. Wow, that's really good and that's great for the long term. Goldman Sachs and Accenture um, and um, one other one of their one of their peers. Uh, I know a lot of people who search for people who used to work at Goldman Sachs. Okay. So that will that will take you far. Um, that'll that'll that kind of a thing really does um, last long. Um, so what I want you to do is go to the Goldman Sachs company page on LinkedIn and follow it. When you follow the company, right next to the company, you see the number of followers. And you can actually click on that number and see who is following the company. It's, it's open information. That's pretty cool. The next thing you're going to do is look at how you are connected. Now, I'm looking at Megapath here. This is how I'm connected to Megapath. You're likely going to see something different because I'm connected to some of their executives, nine first degree connections and 311 second degree, connection, degree connections and 758 total people on LinkedIn. The cool thing is right below that, is a see all button. Hard to see it because it's just in text and it's light blue text at that. But when you're looking at a company page and you click on that see all button, it's going to return a search for you of all the employees who are currently working at that company. And then you can search for keywords or for titles or for locations and you can filter the search. That's really important because you want to find people who might be a coach or a mentor at that company to help you get a foot in the door. Does that make sense to everybody? Yes. Perfect. When you are looking at a computer screen, a lot of times there are things that are available on that screen that are right in front of you and I don't want you to miss out on some of this stuff. So what's missing right in front of you? When you're looking at somebody else's profile, for example, you're following Goldman Sachs and you went and you looked at at, um, at one person's profile, up at the top right, to the, that right hand column is full of valuable information and a lot of people ignore it. But there's people similar to Sean and there's like 30 people that they, you keep clicking that button on the side and there's like 30 people that will continue to show up. As you draw your mouse over each one of those people, you'll see their name change, where they, who they are, their title at their company and there's an invitation there to connect or, or do whatever. I also picked this particular screenshot to show you the difference in pictures. The first lady, great smile, close up, you can look her in the eye. The second lady, she's out somewhere and that's cool but you can't really see her. And then the third one, not completely appropriately dressed. Great picture, does not belong in a professional environment on LinkedIn. Um, and then of course the, the last picture uh, makes you the mystery man of the day. Um, the other thing that's on the right hand side is people also viewed. Now when I look at people also viewed, these are typically people, unless they're really high profile people, you know, if they've got 500 plus connections or you know, if they're not somebody like 30,000 connections like I am um, or widely published or out there in the space a lot, you're going to look at this and you're going to see other people who are likely somebody that these guys know. So if I'm looking at Sean's profile and I see that I want to be a, uh, I want to work at Boxfish and I see this gentleman, the third guy down, Chris, who's a software developer at Boxfish, I might go look at Chris's profile and say, um, see if, if he's somebody who might be able to give me some information about what it's like to work at Boxfish. If that's the case, I'll come back to Sean and say, Sean, do you happen to know Chris? 
And if so, can I send an introduction through you so that I can ask him for an informational interview? Would that be okay? And then I'd send that informational interview, and because it's coming through Sean, somebody Chris knows, that gives me more credibility and allows me to tap into the influence of my friend. So when you're inviting others to connect, um, there's a great way to do it. I, know, I mentioned already people you know and people you'd like to know or people you might work with. So there's three quick steps. First of all, look at somebody's profile and examine it. You know, Look at their headline. Look at their summary, who they are, what they're all about. Look at their interests. And when you put interests in your profile, if you're into boating, don't just say boating. Say kayaking or um, schooners or um, motorboats. You know, um, if you're into skiing, don't just say skiing, say downhill skiing or slalom. Um, talk about the music you love, talk about the genre, talk about the artists, talk about the specific songs. Whatever it is that floats your boat, put that stuff down and make it specific because when people see that and it resonates with them, that is a point of interest. That's the budding of a relationship with another human being that you're going to experience happening. We want to connect with each other on a human level. And we want to know people, we want to meet people, we want to engage with people who understand us, who get us, and who are going to be fun to be around. And typically, people who are more fun to be around are people who are more like us and like the things that we like. So that kind of, that kind of stuff can really help. Um, the next thing you're going to do when you click on the connect button, it's going to bring up your invitation screen and you're going to choose the reason. Are we a colleague? Were we students together? Do we do business together? Are we friends? Um, what's the reason I'm connecting? And then you're going to write a short message. Hey, I'd love to connect with you on LinkedIn. I see we have this, this, and this in common. Um, or we met at this event um, at Georgetown the other night and I'd love to stay connected with you and see how our paths grow together in the future. Whatever it is, include your name and your phone number. You cannot put email addresses or URLs in an invitation, but you can put, you know, Lori at georgetownspace.edu and put spaces between the ats and the and the dots. So on your crafting your invitation message, if they should know you or remember you, remind them how. Um, especially for women who changed their name when they got married, or people who have lost a lot of weight, or people who grew up. Um, since the time uh, that you knew somebody, um, be real specific about how you know them so that they'll be more likely to connect. If you know people in common, reference that person in common. Maybe I know you through because we both know Sean, and I'm going to say, hey, I'd love to connect with you on LinkedIn. It seems we both are friends of Sean, and um, isn't he a great guy? He's a fun guy to be around, and like people like to hang out together, I bet you'd be fun to hang around too. Although you can say it a little bit differently. I am shooting from the hip here. Um, and if you don't know them, state the benefit to them for connecting with you. Uh, you know, what is it that you have to offer? And I got to tell you, especially with the economy, the way that it's been the last five years or, or pre the previous five years, um, it's getting better now. But there are a lot of people that were out of work either for the first time in their life, um, for the first time in a lot of years, or they just completely, and nobody was immune. It was executives all the way down to the, the blue collar workers. People were unemployed, laid off, fired, company shut down, whatever. And there is nobody who feels more desperate than somebody who's out looking for a job, who's got bills to pay and a family to support. And when you feel desperate, you don't feel like you've got value, but you've always got something of value to connect to people for. You've always got something of value to offer them. Your knowledge, your advice, your experience, your stories, I don't care what it is, figure out what your value is and state that benefit clearly to people and they'll want to connect with you as well. So how do we foster a strong referral community? This is important for you guys because you are about to embark on the journey of a lifetime, uh, the journey of your lifetime. And being in the know is really what brings you the best opportunities. Staying in touch with people will help foster that strong referral community. When you find and engage people, when you research opportunities, um, even if an opportunity isn't right for you, make a mental note of it because you may be engaging with somebody on LinkedIn in a group or somebody who you happen to see that they're looking for what you just saw 
And if you can refer them to that, you've just made a friend. And a, not just a friend, but what I call a super fan, because you made a difference in that person's life, especially if it turns out that they're going to get the job. They're going to remember who it was that referred them to that job. And you'll be able to ask for referrals as well. So ask for what you need, offer value, and always be authentic. Always be yourself. Um, so lesson takeaways for tonight. You've got the profile info guide, the networking for nerds. And I want to talk a little bit about best practices. Once you get your profile built and you're building your network and you're out there engaging and stuff, there is nothing more important than consistent activity. Do you guys know what happens if you take a penny on day one and you double it every day? In 30 days, you'll have a million dollars. Now, consistent activity is what's really crucial. So five minutes a day, I want you to be on LinkedIn and go look at your homepage and just like and comment on somebody on, on people's status updates. Let them know you're there. When you like a status update on LinkedIn, just like on Facebook, it puts your name there. Lori Ruff liked your status update. And if you comment, lo and behold, you not only get your name there, you get your picture there so people can see you. And again, that picture close up is real important because the one that shows up on the bottom is really small. So you want to show up and let people know you're there. And the biggest gift of all is that you're listening. So when you like and comment on other people's status updates and their discussion posts, they feel that they've been heard and they know that you're the person that heard them. So five minutes a day. If you want to take it to twice a day, that's brilliant. Do a little bit in the morning, do a little bit around lunchtime, maybe do a little bit more in the evening where you engage in more groups. So your five minutes, set a timer so that you don't go over. Because if you're like me, I love video games. I remember when Duke Nukem came out and I got about 10 o'clock at night, I got set down in front of the computer and I was going to play Duke Nukem and figure this game out and have a little bit of fun. And about 3.30 in the morning, my husband said, are you coming to bed? And I didn't realize it was 3.30 in the morning. I was just into playing the video game. I was lost. And I thought, wow, I can't do that anymore. But that timer on your smartphone or whatever will really let you feel what five minutes on LinkedIn feels like. So you're going to scan your home page. And then you're going to go to a couple of groups, maybe two or three groups. And you're going to scan the discussion board of the groups. And you're going to just like and comment on what other people say. Don't worry about posting your own stuff. And then later on in the day, you may spend a little bit of time looking at the job boards. I don't know if anybody's interested in living in Denver, Colorado. It's an incredibly beautiful place. Yesterday it snowed. This weekend it was 70 degrees. Um, today it's still cold, but the snow has melted. 300, 300 days of sunshine a year and all kinds of outdoor activities. It's amazing. So say you want to move to Denver and that's where you want to you know, hang your hat. That's where you're looking for a place to go. So you join the Link to Denver group, a regional group on LinkedIn, and you look at the job board and jobs that are posted in Denver and people that are talking about job discussions, job related and career related things are all going to be on the job board. There's probably some there for DC. I know there's one for Link to Minnesota is huge. Link Seattle is huge group. There's regional groups. There's special interest groups. I'm a member of the Mustang Enthusiast Club. I had a 67 um, Mustang Fastback that came with a toolbox. Sadly, I was under that car more than I was in it, and that is the year I stopped wearing skirts. Um, I just got to tell you, getting in and out from under a car with a skirt on was not fun. Um, but I'm passionate about Mustangs. I love them. And you know what? I'm a member of the Mustang Enthusiast Group. And since people can only be a member of 50 groups, and I talk in my profile about loving Mustangs, and I'm a member of the Mustang Enthusiast Group, people see the consistency of my message and see the consistency of my actions and believe that if I'm going to tell the truth about that, I'm likely going to tell the truth about other things as well. If they can trust me in that, they can trust me in other areas as well. I hope that makes sense to everybody. Um, door prize for everybody, rocklinkedin.com. I know today was a just a quick overview. We only have you know a little bit of of um, of time, um, you know, to kind of go over the overview of what's important on LinkedIn. But rocklinkedin.com is where you can see a video about the business methodology, handouts, um, the PDFs are there. We have webinars there. This will probably be loaded up next week. 
Um, we have how-to lessons that are videos from anywhere from three to five minutes long all the way up to eight to ten minutes long. And in marketing, we have a few like how to start a group and create a company page that are much longer, but you probably aren't going to be interested in that in a while. So take that down, rocklington.com. It's a free registration site, and uh, we put all our good stuff out there. And if you learn nothing else, if you remember nothing else from tonight, um, the most important thing that I can share with you is to be more than the person on the other side of the computer screen. Be human, act human, and show your humanity on LinkedIn and in social media, and you will be wildly successful. So that is um, that is what I have for you this evening. You can get me at training at integratedalliances.com or 773-71-SASSY. We'll get you to be on my team. Reach out to me on any platform, and I will answer your question. And I'm super busy, so if I don't answer you the first time, don't be embarrassed about pinging me a second time or a third time if that's what it takes. Um, sometimes when I'm on the road uh, for a few weeks at a time, it gets hard to stay up with communications. But I don't want to miss you. Um, I would miss out on cool opportunities like this if Sean hadn't reached out to me and said hello. Um, and thankfully, he didn't have to ask twice. But if you know, if I am doing this, and I hope you guys are grateful. But I'm grateful too because this is what rocks my world. This is what I'm passionate about. So I am ready for questions from you. And um, I I've got my LinkedIn screen live so I can do. Um, I can show you some demos on the screen if you like, or answer any questions. Anyone want to go first? I'll start with a technical question. Sure. Um, so, being a student, I don't have very much experience, uh, like full year or full time experience, and I wasn't quite sure. I was actually looking at my LinkedIn profile as you were talking, um, as you were talking and going through and making sure I had. Kind of everything you were discussing, and I realized a lot of the jobs say I've been working there for you know two, three years, but it's really just like a summer job or a part-time job. And I was just wondering, like, is there any way to specify that? Like, how do I go about saying only work part-time or only work during the summer without sounding kind of? That, that's a really great question, and and I would you know in in each job description you've got two thousand characters, like you do the summary. I would list the job and the dates and include the months, and then say this was a summer job for. Uh, where I did this, this, and this, um, and this was the impact I had on the company. Or this is who the company was, what they were about, what my role was at the company. Um, but started off saying that this was a summer job or this was a part-time job while I was in school. And those are, you know, people know that you're graduating. You've been busy. Hopefully, you've been paying attention to your studies and you're getting good grades and stuff, right? Um, so they want to see work experience if you have it, but. Everybody recognizes the fact that most students don't work full time. Great. Cool. Who else? Okay, um, just kind of a disclaimer. Right now, I don't have a LinkedIn, but um, could you elaborate more on when it's appropriate to to uh, to connect with other people on LinkedIn? Like, I'll typically go to like a networking event or a recruiting event and exchange cards and follow up with an email. But is that appropriate to connect as well? And I guess specifically specifically with recruiters as well. Like when you should connect with them, or should you just kind of stick to emails? What's your thought on that? I connect to everybody that I meet that I possibly can because that allows them to stay. It allows me to capture them into my own personal web, right? So when I showed you that um, slide of the social graph, there was one big dot in the middle of it that's really hard to see. But everybody that you bring in, that you connect, um, you know, emails can be changed. LinkedIn profiles probably. Somebody's always going to go back to it eventually. Facebook profiles, people are there. Even if they change their email or their phone number, they move. Um, those kinds of things stay consistent. So the more places that you can connect to, play, to people, the stronger that relationship is going to get over time. Um, I will tell you that sometimes recruiters are not um, open to connecting with candidates because they don't want to connect to a candidate giving you false hope. But if you say to, if anybody says, well, I don't really connect to candidates, say, look, I'm not expecting that this will lead to a job. I'm hoping that either now or over the course of my career that we'll be able to stay in touch. And if you ever need somebody like me again, you'll be able to find me. Um, and a lot of recruiters will just say, hey, connect to everybody. So it, you'll find people with different mindsets um, and different ideas of what their own best practices are. And, and actually, I'm glad you asked that question because here's a best practice for you guys. 
you've got to decide. We live in a very, very open world, very online world, and when you do any kind of activity out there, um, it could cause somebody to say yes or no. Um, one of my dear friends is a uh, serves on a lot of boards of directors, and he was invited to apply to to be on the board of directors of AARP, which is a huge, huge national association for the association. Um, American Association of Retired Persons, I think is what it stands for. Well, they went and looked at his Twitter feed and said, wow, you're a little bit too conservative for us. Now, see, I would have thought I want more diversity on my board, but the, he was a little bit too conservative for them. So understand that what you put out there will give people an idea of who you are and what you think. So use some care um, in that and in being yourself. It's fine to have fun. I will talk about going out and drinking with my friends, but I'm not a college student that people are have um, bias towards or you know the, the whole, oh, it's a college student, they shouldn't be out drinking and partying all night long, and they assume every college student is, right? So you've got to step above that. Um, I probably should step above that too, but <laughs> <laughs> I'm just going to, it's too much work. I'm already you know working a lot, so I'm trying to decide. What is it? But when I got into this space, I knew immediately this is going to be a very public life I lived. What was I willing to share? But you get to draw that line, and you draw the line in the sand. You can make, move it later, but when you draw it ahead of time, you recognize it as you approach it, as opposed to saying, oh, shucks, you know, I should have stopped an hour ago. You know? Or don't post that picture of me, or don't allow friends to tag. Make those decisions now. You'll be glad you did. Thank you. Sure. Who else? So I have a question about viewing profiles. Like you said, if you want to work for a certain company, look at the person's profile and, and copy it almost. Um, but there's also, you get a notification when someone views your profile, and you can see who viewed it quite often. Do you recommend turning it off, or is it okay if that person receives that? That's a great question. I leave mine on, for the most part, unless I'm doing some stealth mode business intelligence, because I want people to know I looked at their profile. Now, I want people to know I looked at their profile because I want to do business with them, and I'm bold and bodacious about asking for it. Um, I want to do an interview with them on our radio show or on a Hangout or for some training or something that we're doing, uh, or I might be asking them for an interview for one of the columns that I write. So I want people to know that I looked at their profile. Um, my partner, on the other hand, does a lot of business intelligence, checking out the organizational structure of a company, going in and, and digging for um, you know, research, trying to learn what he can. Um, a lot of recruiters will turn off their visibility. Um, and it's okay to do that, but a lot of people now know that you can view who's viewed your profile. And if you view the profile of a hiring manager, and they come back and they see that you viewed their profile, that might pique their interest, and that might be the catalyst that causes them to reach out to you as a potential candidate. So for the most part, I would say leave it on, unless you're looking at somebody um, that, and you don't want them to know, like an ex. <laughs> Just saying. And it's real quick. Do you guys know where to access your settings? Well, obviously those of you who don't have a LinkedIn profile yet. When you look at the LinkedIn screen, on the top right side, there's a little bitty square with your picture on it, and there's the notifications area and stuff like that. You can click on your picture, and that will open up a, a drop-down box, and your privacy settings, um, you can review them there. There's lots of choices. Any other questions? Could you, could you like reiterate about the different industries and how you think that, like, I know that in the technology world that LinkedIn is very important, but I hear that in the finance world it's not necessarily the case. Well, what are your thoughts on that? Like, I, that's what I've heard of. Is there, do you think that's wrong? That's the interesting thing. So some, some companies, like John Hancock, haven't really figured it out yet. What do we do? Um, other companies, like Ameritrade, not only put their all of their financial um, advisors on LinkedIn, they encourage them to connect to people in their network, in their community, and um, and let them know that they were available for private help. They, there are um, SEC rules that say you can and cannot do certain things. You can't show recommendations, for example. Um, you can't show your endorsements, for example, that kind of thing. It doesn't mean you can't get them, it just means you can't show them. Um, but there's a gentleman in South Dakota, for example, who is a financial planner 
Um, he works, I forgot who he works for, um, but Tim Shoot, and he's on LinkedIn on a regular basis, and his comment to me two weeks ago was, because um, I, I wanted to introduce him to a friend who's just getting started, he said, I am an envy of your friend just starting now with LinkedIn, because when a financial services professional gets going, you have got to hustle, and you got to build your book of business as fast as you can so that you start getting money in the door, but... Ten years later, you're like, how do I get rid of these junk accounts and these people that are sucking my time that aren't in my area of focus and, and such like that? Now, with LinkedIn and social media, you've got the opportunity to find people that you want to go after that you'd like to work for them or you'd like to build your book of business with them. And you can, you can um, really dive into your niche a lot faster. It doesn't mean you, you message them through LinkedIn. You might find them and then reach to them outside of that. Um, there's some kind of service that allows you to pay $250 a month or, uh, or sorry, like $50 a month or $250 a year or something like that. And, um, or five, whatever it is, $550 a year. I can't do the math. I'm, I'm not running the books in my company, just so you know. Uh, Lori does not, um, Lori's dyslexic. <laughs> so, Lori doesn't do the books. Um, but it, it really, that is a growing industry. It's actually, it was the second fastest growing industry on, on LinkedIn for a while. Right now, students are. Um, life sciences is huge on LinkedIn. Oil and gas exploration. I mean, if you think about it, remember, LinkedIn is a networking environment, right? So there's a group of about 170 oil and gas engineers with a particular specialty, and that's almost all of them in the world. They're all on LinkedIn. They all joined a group and they share best practices with each other in that group. I mean, how powerful is that, right? There are people who, um, I know a guy, we had him on our radio show out of Florida. Um, I'm trying to remember, uh, Charismatic. Uh, he did a studio album, a Christian album in the studio. He found the studio, the producer, the musicians, and the lyricists, everybody he needed for the project he found on LinkedIn. You know, there, it's a networking platform, so think networking first. What do I need? Who do I need? Why do I need? And then go to LinkedIn, and that's where you can find pretty much everything. They're really becoming ubiquitous. Great question. Thanks. Did that answer it, though? I mean, the, the for the yeah. industries and stuff? Good. Thank you. You're welcome. So if I'm not really sure what industry or field I want to go into, and there's like a range of ones I'm interested in, would I list them all? Or I don't want to make it, make it seem like laundry listing and like I don't have any direction. But. So that's a, that's a great question because really, I mean, if you think about it, when you post your industry on LinkedIn, when it asks you what industry you're a member of, well, what do you say if you're not in one yet, right? Um, and you're only allowed one. Um, and like we did on Robert's profile, we said he's interested in sales, marketing, or project management, which seems quite diverse, but it's really not. Um, so you've got the opportunity in your summary to talk about the things you love to do. And if you're really not sure, you might describe a project that you really enjoyed working on or a job that you really enjoyed and why. Was it the manager that you enjoyed working with and what was that person like? So try to create, um, tell the story of what you've enjoyed in the past, and that'll help people look at it and say, wow, that's what our managers are like, or that's what our environment is like, or that's <coughs> really resonates. This, is, this, this could be a good cultural fit. And I'll tell you what, a cultural fit is more important than you knowing how to do the job. Because if you don't get along with the people you're working with, life is going to suck, like horribly. Right? And a lot of companies in a previous life before LinkedIn, I was consulting with companies about finding employees that fit culturally and then putting them in the right seat in the company and training them to do the job that was required or the job that you wanted them to grow into. So great question. Anybody else? Yes. I have one last question. Um, one of my big fears, kind of going off what Eileen said, uh, of uh, just laundry listing accomplishments. You know, I don't want to uh, have my LinkedIn be too wordy or make it sound like I'm just kind of any possible word I've ever gotten or like I've been just listing. So how do you decide, you know, which ones are actually important and which ones should I maybe save for conversation or just not put on at all, you know? 
So if you're saving it for conversation, you might include it in your summary and maybe not talk about it later or talk about it later. The cool thing is, I mean, if you look at my profile, I, I don't print my profile anymore because I don't want to kill that many trees. I've been on LinkedIn for nine years, right? 2005. Um, and you're, you're going to grow over time. So listing the honors and awards, and if it's a valid thing, if you're not just trying to stuff, uh, but you're listing things that are valid, then list them. Because this is the time where you've got to talk about yourself and listing those things. And then especially if people recommend you and mention those things, um, then you've got a double bonus. And as a matter of fact, what I do is whenever somebody recommends me on LinkedIn and writes a written recommendation, I look at it and see is the, is the way they describe me consistent with other places on my LinkedIn profile. If somebody says I pay a lot of something that they will never say, by the way. Lori pays attention to a lot of detail. Mm -hmm. Only if I have a Tylenol first. Uh, but if they were happen to say that, and, and it was true, I might look up in my summary and say that I pay attention to detail. That's me talking about myself and kind of tooting my own horn. But I've also, a little bit further down my profile, I have a written recommendation that says that and backs that up. So always look at recommendations that come in and make sure that you've got that content in your profile to make, things, make sure things are consistent and that you are talking about yourself in an authentic way. Great, thank you. You're welcome. Anything else? So if you have um, job experience that's not relevant to what you've done, say like working in a summer camp, should you bother including that on your LinkedIn? Good question. I don't put, um, I've got my previous business on LinkedIn um, and I stopped it there. First of all, I started that business in 1996 and um, I, do not look as old as I am, nor do I act it. So I surprise a lot of people when I get on stage and I say, I look great for 60, don't I? And they're like, and I'm like, I didn't say I was 60. I said I look great for 60. Difference. Um, listen carefully. The thing is that when you, um, I just almost completely lost my train of thought there. When you are, uh, are out there uh, being authentic and being portraying yourself in an authentic manner, that's going to be what's really important. And one way to do that is to, um, and all of a sudden I think I'm not answering your question, but I'm going to go ahead and finish this thought anyway. Um, when you are writing your profile or about to send out a lot of messages or do a lot of activity of outreach, have peers and a couple of other people look at your profile and make sure it sounds like you and that it portrays you well. Now tell me your question one more time because I think I lost track of it. Whether to include previous job experience, like the summer camp or something. Right. Thank you. So, you know, summer camps and stuff would be cool because um, if it's a summer camp with kids and you want to work with children, put that down. If it's a summer camp and you had um, responsibilities, like you had to get up at 530 in the morning and feed the horses and muck the stalls, put that down because that shows a strength of character, right? It shows that you're willing to do whatever it takes to get the job done. You're not um, to good to get your hands dirty or, or that you made accomplishments and stuff, especially if you can identify accomplishments, put it down. But I stopped at um, Document Solutions of NC and then I put Community Theater. How many of you have a name that could be spelled more than one way? Like Sean or Lori or, yeah, right? So common misspellings of my name. If you met somebody at a networking event and they're trying to look you up, um, I have community theater in my profile where I put, my name is Lori Ralph, I'm the LinkedIn diva. You can spell Lori, you know, other other spellings of my name include L-O-R-I, L-O-R-I-E, L-O-R-R-I, L-O-L-A-U-R-I-E, all that kind of stuff. And I made it a little bit fun too. I said, you know, it's really just Lori, L-O-R-I, Ruff, all the different kinds of ways to spell Ruff, but it's just Lori Ruff, LinkedIn diva, and I'm blonde. You know, just kind of threw in a little bit of personality there. but. You know, if the job was five years ago and it was in high school and it was um, totally not relevant, probably don't put it down. But I got to say that any job at this point that you had, those speaks to the fact that you're employable and show some skill that you learn, whether it's being able to run a cash register or work independently or have some kind of responsibility. Does that make sense to everybody? And then later, as you grow in your career, you may take that off. Um, but for right now, I'm going to go with putting it on and showing 
the value of that job as opposed to leaving it off and having people think you've never worked before. But if you want, you know what, if, if you've got a very specific question about that or if you want some advice on how to do it, if you'll register on Rock LinkedIn and listen to the how-to videos about building your profile, when your profile is done, if you'll send me a note with a link to your profile, I'll review it for you and give you some advice on how you might make it a little bit better. Cool. Because how many of you are in the room, right? How long would that take me? Yeah, you're probably not going to all do it at once. And I could be sitting, I mean, I, lo I love March Madness. I'm very sad that it's over. But what a March Madness this year was. Oh, my God. I never, never, ever, ever would have predicted that. But for you kind of go two for two, I'm getting goosebumps. Anyway, um, and I love football. And you know what? This year they've announced Thursday night football. So Sunday, Monday, and Thursday night, I've got all kinds of time because I'm going to be in front of the TV either at, you know, TGI Fridays or a friend's house or somewhere. And that's the time that, you know, I have my laptop on my lap and I'm doing relaxing kind of things. I told you, this is what I'm passionate about. This is what I love. And sometimes people send me, say, hey, okay, you read my profile and I'll send them back notes. That's when I do it, you know. So it's not really a bother. Um, and it's something fun for me. And it, it allows me to provide some value back. And then as you progress in your career, who do you think of when you need help? social media or LinkedIn or anything. You're going to come back to Lori because she provided you such value to begin with. And that goes back to my point at the beginning that every single one of you has something of value that you can offer the world. If you will give that value or that knowledge, people will come back to you and ask you for your wisdom. And your wisdom is what they will pay you for. Does that make sense? Well, I will be around all night, so even later on, if you guys have a question, Sean, go ahead and give him my email address. Absolutely. And um, you can look me up on LinkedIn. Don't send me a LinkedIn invitation, though. Send me an email, and I'll send you one, because I get about 500 a week, and they only show you five at a time, so I I'll lose it. It'll, it'll get lost fast. So just send me an email if you'd like to connect. Um, I'm maxed out, but what I do is I delete old, um, irrelevant people. <laughs> <laughs> so I can accept cool people like you. I mean, come on. So you know, I've I've deleted countries. You know, and so what I'm saying, there's a limit. There's a limit. But um, anyway, you can and you can follow me on LinkedIn too because I'm publishing there now too. So I'm a LinkedIn influencer finally. Uh, but you know, read as much as you can. Keep your eyes and ears open. Always be honest with each other too. If you see something that somebody else is doing and it comes across kind of weird, you don't have to tell them in public. But if you know them, tell them in private. Say, hey, you know, you posted this thing the other day, and I, I get what you're saying now, but my first thought was this, because we, I mean, 140 characters. I've said things that I wish I hadn't said, um, or I said things that I knew what I meant at the time, but I went back and read it later, or somebody else read it, and they're like, Lori, really? You know, so you're gonna have to be okay with critique. And, and constructive criticism, not only for each other, but of yourself. Um, and learn to accept it in public and accept it graciously. Thank somebody for being that. Sorry, that was filtering. Um, thank somebody for being um, polite enough to, to point it out to you. And, um, and then get on with life, because that's going to just kind of blow away in the wind really quickly. But there, there's a quote out there that I said like three or four years ago, social media is here. It's not a passing fan. It's where your customers are. Be where your customers are in social media. And people are putting that out on graphics and stuff. And this is 2014. I'm like, duh. You know, but sometimes you're going to say something really insightful that continues to resonate with people and claim it, own it, and, and just realize that that insight could be good or it could be kind of quirky. And, and just read it a second time before you hit update or publish or start or whatever post well thank you guys I really appreciate you spending the evening with me thank you so thank much you so if you're ever in Georgetown please let us know we'll have to take you out and talk some more I will do that thank you thank you so much